Hi, everybody. I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. On today's episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, I had a fascinating and wide-ranging talk with Harvey Smith, legendary industry designer. He's currently the studio director at Arcane Studios and co-creative director on the upcoming Redfall. Among many other things, Harvey talked at length about developing emergent mechanics and how they can lead to magic moments in development. He also covered the importance of research to underpin the creative decisions one makes during development and how it can lead to entertaining discoveries. And he highlighted how representation in games is so important culturally and creatively. Please join us. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Harvey, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, it's about to be a super stormy day in Austin, Texas, so let's hope that the, uh, the bandwidth goddess is uh, on our side. So do you actually lose electricity pretty frequently or internet connection during big storms? No, but after this last year where we had like that epic uh, ice storm and no power for days and no water for days and all that, I don't, I don't take anything for granted. That was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure a lot of folks who are listening to this haven't been through something like that before. You guys are completely shut down, right? I mean, just that city, the cities around in the area. It was mind blowing. Yeah, it, it it got way colder than anyone expected, and there was way more ice build up. And apparently, we have a dumb setup for our grid, which is independent. The United States. I know now more about power grids than I ever thought I would. Like the United States has two major power grids, and a third one, which is just for Texas, all special. And of course, there was a overflow, you know, in the other grids that we could have taken, but because we're separate, uh, we couldn't. And so, anyway, long story short. Um, some people were really, really unlucky and had, uh, you know, days and days without power and without water. Um, I think we had a few days without clean water where we had to boil everything. And then we had about 15 hours with no power. And I say lucky, but in truth, it's probably not divided that way. It's probably divided socioeconomically somehow in some terrible way. Uh, but yeah, it was a big deal. And, you know, probably like a little taste of some stuff coming for climate change. And, and as far as I can tell, nothing's been done about it yet. So (laughs) I know there's been a lot of talk and and a lot of arguments about it. And yeah, you're right. Like as Mm -hmm. is typical with politics, I don't know Mm -hmm. what happens. So going back a little bit further, uh, you served in the air force for six years, right? Yeah, I did. After, after high school, I, Bummed around my hometown for two years, um, playing a lot of D&D and working at convenience stores and gas stations and stuff like that. Um, A car lot for a while, trying to figure out what to do. And mostly knew what I wanted to do was get away from my, you know, this chemical plant town that I grew up in 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 Texas uh, and family and all that. Uh, It was not a good situation. And my then high school girlfriend, you know, graduated a couple of years later. Uh, we got hitched and I joined the Air Force and we moved away to Germany. We lived there for three years. And then we, uh, I was, I went to Florida at some point. I was part of the first special operations comm squadron, went to Saudi Arabia between the Gulf Wars. Uh, that there was a mission, there was a, an airfield in Dahran that had a military attachment. And the, the mission was to enforce the no fly parallels, no fly zone parallel uh, for uh, Saddam Hussein. And it sounds like I'm talking about ancient history or something, right? But uh, it was a wild time. And then when I got out, I I had to decide where to go, right? And I I had grown up camping in Austin. I loved Austin. It's a very different town today. But back then it was like, you can imagine, it was like, I don't even know, a couple of hundred thousand people, college town, very much dominated by, you know, music and games and writing and, and like art. 
um, because of the percentage of college kids, I think. And it was just also like the gateway to the hill country. It's like, you know, it, it's Texas version of beautiful, which is still pretty rustic. But um, anyway, and I, I moved back here and eventually got a job with a game company because I just played video games nonstop and loved it, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was kind of how I escaped. Everybody has a different, um, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, you graduated high school and got sent off to the Ivy league or whatever. And if so, I applaud you and your parents. Uh, but you know, there are different paths for different folks. Right. And so for me, that's, that was an easy way. And the air force was a lot of fun. People, people always ask about it and they think it must've been a nightmare or something, but it was actually, I knew some amazing people. I traveled, living in Germany, like got to got to see the world. You know, I was from a small town, and uh, the job was cool too. Satellite communications, um, you know, it was vaguely high tech, even though I was a technic a technician, just a grunt, you know. But um, but yeah, it was pretty. It was it was a pretty pivotal move in my life if you look back through all the all the different moves I've made. And you know, because if I hadn't done that, what would I have been doing? I, my dad worked in a chemical plant. Uh, there weren't great jobs there. There's shrimpers, chemical plants. There's a real estate agent, I guess. You know, this, there's like a few cards like that. If you put it into a game form, um, move away is the one that I I played. Did uh, did that time in Germany and Florida and and working with other folks in the military influence how you approach game design in the future? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, probably seeing probably seeing. Germany and the UK uh, broadened me a lot because I lived in a German village of like, I don't know, 2000 people. Nobody's ever heard of it. It's called Quietersbach. And uh, there was a hill. I lived up there in an apartment in this attic apartment that this family had. It was a graveyard, a bunch of farmland around it, a cheese shop. Sometimes we'd get snowed in and like, you know, walk down to the bakery and live on the food that we could walk to because we couldn't drive anywhere when it was snowed in. It probably broadened me. And may, maybe one of the best things that happened to me during that time was there was a literary club with the University of Maryland. And this is one of those little, little tiny corners of the world that probably no one, everyone has one of these, right? But like nobody would have heard of this or anything. But there were all these expat professors who like loved the idea of living with their husband or wife or whatever in Germany. Um, and then moving their families over. Most of my new had had kids and all that, and and they would teach their classes to GIs and to German students who who like would come on to the like little military base campus. Uh, and then and there was a big campus in Munich as well. Uh, I'm not sure why, but anyway, they had a literary club uh, called the Gathering. And so these people like who had gone to Cornell and taught at places like that. And we're all working on novels and stuff. Uh, they were very much boomer writers, right? And so a whole they, a whole Generation X group of their students would participate with them, and we'd have meetings at somebody's apartment, you know, uh, a couple of times a month. And it was exposure to me. I didn't go to university, so it was an exposure to me to this whole way of thinking and kind of culture and stuff. And it, it put a huge mark on me, like. Uh, made my fiction better and, and uh, I don't know, maybe better as a person, probably. Uh, it was the beginning of a long grind of an education for me that I had missed in school. Hmm. Uh, and a few years after that, I'd be working on Deus Ex with um, Warren Spector and a you know, team of about 20 or 30 people. And again, that was a highly kind of political game in a sense. And so geopolitical power and, and haves and have nots and all that. And so again, it was like, going from a position of relative ignorance to, you know, studying up on all that. Why do people fall for conspiracy theories and uh, what do people do with power and what does power do to them? And uh, what's the outcome of some of these technologies that are, that are, you know, running their course right now. And um, you know, it's one of those things where you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. You can start a project and then at the end of the project, you feel not a different person, like, not like you're a different person, but, but like you're vastly leveled up in some area. Uh, you're different than when you started in a good way, you know, and it's, uh, I think that gets overlooked a lot is that in creative and technical endeavors, regardless of what happens and how many copies it sells and whatever people like it or hate it or whatever, 
you just did a deep dive into some area and uh, whether it was fantasy or real or whatever. And at the end of it, you, you're changed by that. Um, and I know it's, it must be true for everybody. I think you're right. That's a great observation. I mean, especially when we're all working on these, these things, there's no, there's usually no blueprint for them. Right. So a lot of yeah. we have to discover on our own. So you're right. It's, it's a, it is a great leveling up process, as you said. Yeah. The, the no blueprint thing is really interesting because it's like, I feel like if I built a bridges, you know, I'd go, I would have gone to engineering school. <laughs> like I would have made it through engineering school, but I, I, I would have gone to engineering school and somebody would have said, here's how you build this kind of bridge. And here's how you build the suspension bridge. And here, you know, and you can kind of innovate with it and whatever, take advantage of the environment maybe and colors and new materials and uh, different needs and try something crazy like that one that there's a, br a famous bridge in I think in Northern Europe where it literally an arm lifts the chunk out and moves it out of the way. It looks like something out of a crazy video game, but um, you know, there's a way to do things. And in very often in what we do, there's no way to do it or there isn't some genre sense, but then you, you don't have out of the box tools to do that. You have to do it yourself. And then some other element in your game or some other feature uh, will completely change the way you do that thing anyway, because you have to support, uh, like if you're making a vampire game, you have to support staking or something, you know, that's, and it thereby changes some other part that is normally taken for granted in it is existing genre or, or, or game or whatever. And so there's no blueprint. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Well, you, you started at a time where there really weren't any. I mean, you talk about tools back on, on the Ultima series, right? When you got, when you joined um, Richard Garriott, uh, and by the way, Ultima 1 and 2 were probably two of my favorite games on the Apple II. Um, mm -hmm. But when you joined, I remember playing those games and thinking to myself, how, how do you make this? Like mm -hmm. there, there, wasn't, there wasn't any kind of uh, Unity or any kind of tool set that one could actually use other than those that were built at developers at the time. Yeah, all, and that all feels like it's weird how things feel like generations, probably similar to people who have gone to different schools where you come into the school and you you're around the seniors or the people working on their master's degree or whatever. And if you think about it, like an 18 or 19 year old comes into a college and if they bump into somebody working on their Ph.D., this is a person who could have been around for eight years. And if you look at the 18 year old, it was like they were 10 years old when this other person started their PhD or whatever. And so in that same way, I worked on Ultima eight with Richard and a small team of people. And in fact, I didn't work on the core game. I just worked on the re-release, the CD re-release, hmm. uh, which is kind of a, I don't know if I've told this story before, but like the game came out, I, I came to the company because I was such a fan of Ultima seven Serpent Isle and Blackgate. And I was such a fan of Underworld, which Looking Glass had made, but Origin had published. That was my favorite game of all time. And I was working in QA and I worked there for about a year before I got pulled into development. But I wrote this report just on my own. I wasn't even on the project, but Ultima 8 came out and there were a bunch of reasons that it really infuriated me. And so I wrote this report to my boss, Kay uh, Gilmore, and who still works for, or now she, I, we, she works upstairs for me, theoretically, if we ever go back to the office. Uh, we've The long winding paths have taken us to back to both to Zenimax companies. But anyway, um, I wrote this report and I wrote like a hundred issues. Like here's one thing that is wrong with the game. Here's another thing. It was just like a hundred line items. And I wrote a little preamble at the beginning and I called it a slap in the face to Ultima fans and things like that. And one day I was sitting at my desk okay, this has been, this demon has been exercised. This anger has been leased out into the world or whatever, loosed out into the world. And I was sitting at my desk and I had that uncomfortable feeling in the cubicle form. All the QA people just sat there and customer service was nearby. And everybody kind of had that like lemur, like, or not lemur, but like meerkat, like, uh, you know, kind of eyes popping up, kind of like danger is coming. Uh, and I felt this weight on my desk and I looked over and <laughs> Richard was sitting on my desk holding that report. <laughs> and I thought, oh shit, I thought I was going to have a career in game. I thought I was going to work in games for a while, but I, I'm going to be fired, aren't I? You know? And so I was sitting there and he, he was holding these papers and it was so incredibly intimidating because this is a guy who like, 
uh, you know, helped create part of the industry, you know, the, the RPG part of the industry. And later would become a friend and I know him pretty well. He's a good guy and he, he does a lot of fun, interesting stuff. Um, he's lived a charm, lucky life and made a lot with it. Um, did a lot of cool stuff with it. But at the time he was like, so this report, <laughs> you, you wrote up a hundred things. You called it a slap in the face to RPG fans or to Ultima fans. And, and I was like, on my best behavior, you know, and I was like, yeah. Uh, and so we talked about it at length and he was like, how would you like a chance to fix those things? And I was like, you've got to be kidding. And so he had talked to my boss Kay and got permission to take me, put me with a producer and a couple of uh, a programmer and a designer. And we write, we marched through that list. We prioritized it and marched through it. And when the game got re-released on, because at that point in time, it was a weird moment in the industry. Everything was coming out on floppies. So you get this rubber band stack of floppies. Um, and right after that, people would release the CD version. And of course, that was the patched version. It had all the content and it. it had voices suddenly. So like I, I worked on uh, as a tester on System Shock. And we did 10 months on that project as in the QA department. And, you know, the first version was floppy and it was brilliant. It was cool. But my God, the second version, you know, the, the re-release, or not the re-release, but the, the CD release uh, had voices. That's where Shodan's voice comes from. That's where the audio logs and all the brilliant audio work that Eric Brosius did on that. Like, it's a different game, you know, because of the audio and the music and the voices, the voice actors. And it, people forget, they just take for granted, like you can talk to people in video games and over video conference and you can, when you play video games, they talk to you and they have great sound, uh, dynamic scores and all that. But that was all, you know, like some of that was new, right? It wasn't that far back from beep and boop. Um, anyway, so we re-released Ultima 8 with the voices, you know, some of the voices added and, and a bunch of those fixes. And it was, there was a, very acerbic uh, game reviewer at the time called Scorpia and she re-reviewed it favorably and stuff. And that, that was like an early moment. And the, re the only reason I go into this is that I started when it felt like these people had been working on Ultima forever. I felt like a poser. I felt like the new kid in town, you know? Um, and so, you know, it, 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 there are these people out there who were working on, when I worked at Midway, I was briefly around, Oh God, I'm, I'm spacing his name right now. Um, Ed the Boone? guy, well, yeah, certainly Ed Boone, also a super nice guy, by the way. Yeah, he is. Um, very, very cool. And Kay, by the way, protected me. She shielded me from my big mouth when you know when I was doing things like that with Richard. But so there were all these people that had been working in games for a while that were were cool. But when I worked at Midway, I worked around people like Ed, and there was also the dude who worked on the basketball games and before had done Spy Hunter. And his name is just eluding me, but he's a super nice guy. Um, and it felt like those people had been working on video games already for like 20 years when I got in the industry or something. It's it's now been around for a while, right? So, and it, and it is goofy and weird. And like part of that period might have been like the silent film era in a sense, you know, if you study the 20s and, you know, um, but, um, and we're still not there really. and probably 10 years from now we'll we'll look at whatever VR system has gone mainstream and look back at the games we're making now and and be like oh my god remember when we did this and this and this but um but anyway yeah i i i was in k gilmore's qa department at origin loved it learned tremendous amounts qa is an amazing place because you not only like kind of like if you're strong enough you can like push back and make sure that you're fighting for the users to quote Tron, you know, like you, you, you can protect parts of the user experience. Um, you can't always, but, but you have an opportunity to. And the other thing is you work with every single part of the company from translators to marketing, to programmers, to audio people. And it's just the, the amount of drinking from a fire hose is just tremendous. Um, yeah. So, and that was, that was a crazy experience and it made me, furious and I left after three years I went to a friend's startup but uh it was a huge pivotal learning experience for me that's great to hear about and, and that time in particular the early 90s that was a pretty special period in our industry despite the fact that to your point people had already been working in the industry for over 20 years but that I mean I remember it vividly was when CD-ROMs hit the scene and all of a sudden 
it was really viable to become a small developer because prior to that point, a lot of the big games were on cartridges and it was really difficult to actually fund a developer if you were doing that. But anyway, I mean, I, I love your, your story. And I, I wanted to ask, you know, looking back on that experience and your experience and your experience over the next few years, uh, is there anything you miss about that period of the, the early to mid nineties in terms of development? Yeah, I would say that the period I truly miss, I mean, yes, there, you know, having game teams of like 20 people or 30 people is special. Any kind of team that's smaller like that. It, I love my teammates now. Um, but, you know, when in modern productions, you're talking about hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, and so the relationships are a little different. And my position's a little different, right? You know, it has to be uh, a little more overview and a little less time with each area. And I have to find and empower specialists in specific areas, some of which I used to work in, but maybe they're better than I was at, at, at those now. They're certainly modernized. Um, so I, I, I do miss the small team size. I you know, and, and some part of me misses the unprofessionalism, for lack of a better word, um, you know, rolling straight from work into role playing games in the in the conference rooms, ordering pizza and all that. But part of me doesn't miss that because it was an exploitative piece and also a piece where it was like at the time it was like way more male and way wider uh, than it is now. Right. So it's it's better in some other ways. And also that it's less, well, I, I, I think for some people it's less exploitative, but um, it's certainly, you know, we have a better understanding of, of when it's abuse versus when it's like work versus when it's, you know, a joy to do. Uh, so many things that we've articulated, even though it seems frustrating to people and even though everyone stays outraged all the time, in, in many cases for good reason. Uh, but I think, you don't, that doesn't take into account the slight progress that is made every month, right? Like it's, it's yeah. just a continual, uh, but anyway, I, so I miss that and I don't miss it. Um, but the, the, to your, to your question, I was going to say the period I really miss is, um, in the mid to late nineties, I was more of a level designer. I worked more as a level mm -hmm. designer and, you know, that whole thing where you can get into the tools, get into Unreal or whatever, and just zone out and work all day and setting up scenarios. If you're, if you're doing what we do, which is like a hybrid of shooter and RPG, this kind of like immersive in the body, in the, in the sense of presence, uh, narrative rich, where like, it feels like people were just in the room that you just walked into and maybe they left their lunch in the trash can and they have a note on the desk and it, it just feels very lived in. Right. Um, and it's part RPG in the sense that you, that there's a, there's a, there's maybe not a, a plot so much, but there are a lot of story elements, a lot of character, a lot of setting work goes into that, but you explore it almost like it's a, a shooter. And then it's got this adventure game layer with some puzzles and stuff too. And it, as a level designer, that's just so fun to work in, honestly, when all the cylinders are firing and you're just like, okay, I know the tools and I know how to do patrol routes and I know how to do breakable glass and put lower notes here and there. And, um, and it, and now it's farmed out. There's like lots of level architects and narrative designers and lots of people to coordinate, to do one. If you have an idea, you know, to do one character or one area. But at the time it was like level designers with a nexus of all of that and did a lot of that work themselves. Um, because right before that, there weren't really, in some places, there weren't even game designers. Like, like at Origin, there were programmers and artists and sometimes producers, I think. Yeah, we already had producers, but, and they had APs at that point, associate producers, because the company had grown. But, and there was always that stoner musician who did all the sound and audio and stuff. But, but um, at the time, there were no tech, technically, there were no game designers. Uh, there was called quality assurance, customer service. And I remember this huge cultural war happening in origin where the ultimates, if you look at them and you're like, well, who did all these missions and quests and, and characters and, uh, the setups, the traps and puzzles and the, the, the encounters, as we would say, if you we were running a D and D game or whatever, 
And somebody would say, well, there was a writer in there. Well, for sure, the writer wrote notes and stuff like that. But but there were people, there were teams of people that set those encounters up. Where you know, Why is this monster here in the cave over there and the ring is in the belly of a fish in the bottom of a lake? And, you know, how do you find, how do you learn about that? And, you know, of course, sometimes it was programmers, sometimes it was artists, but you had these teams of people that weren't either really, and they were just setting that up. And there was this big cultural war about what they should be called because they wanted to be called quest designers or something um, or game designers. And so that offended some of the programmers at the time. And so they called them technical design assistants, which some people at the company supported and some people immediately began referring to as total dumbasses. <laughs> and um, it was just like hellish, right? And uh, so shortly after that, the game industry got grown up enough. Was, you know, California, Silicon Valley led the charge and game industry got big enough to you know, acknowledge that, yes, you need some specialized positions, maybe game systems designers, maybe AI designers to work with the AI engineers. And sometimes those people are engineers and sometimes there's some hybrid of art and engineer and other skills. Uh, but level design is in there as well. And so, um, you know, being a level designer at that period in time was just lucky because I didn't have to have an architecture background. Uh, the tools were the, the pretty rudimentary for setting up patrols and things like that. It wasn't rocket science. Uh, sometimes it is now. Um, and anyway, yeah, I miss that a lot. I miss zoning out and just working on those things, setting up encounters and such. Well, I mean, obviously the, your experience there and, and what you developed on your own has emerged in all the games that you've worked on, at least in my opinion. And I, only, I bring this up because I'm, I'm a fan of emergent mechanics and, and playing Deus Ex, playing Dishonored, right? There's a lot of that in, that in those games where it seems like anything can happen and you have ultimate choice as a player because of all of the mechanics you've enabled in these games. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your sort of emergent me mechanic philosophy. And yeah, has this been a driver for you since those days or, or just an idea you've been fascinated by? Is this, does yeah. this have something with your, your D and D background even? I think that's, those are all insightful uh, lines of inquiry. And, but I think when you talk to me, you're going to get over and over, it's, it's hard to separate what I've done and what I think versus what people around me have done and what they've thought because yeah. very much I'm a sponge and I've, I've had the benefit of working around some bright people that were working on things before me. So I'll answer this question, I think, two ways uh, or three ways. One is, yeah, D&D &D totally is all about that, right? Uh, and I could give you great examples. Um, you know, <laughs> my high school friend, Steve Powers, I still work with him. Uh, we, <laughs> we were in a flying castle uh, you know, uh, kept aloft by the forces of hell. And there was a scripted scene. I'm sure it was a scripted scene where this devil was going to sacrifice this poor character strapped to this wheel, iron wheel. And there was not pretty much nothing we could do that was going to kick something off. Right. But my character was close enough and was invisible or something that I touched the character and, and cast gaseous form, which was like, Hey, any willing creature can become gaseous or whatever. And it eluded the whole scene and it changed everything. And, and it was such a thrill, everybody laughing and talking and Steve having to react. And, and, and like those moments are what I re really D and D works as an exploration game, a social game, a uh, combat simulator, but also, uh, and I th I, a story game, of course, but also like, just exploring mechanics, like improvisationally. What if I took this level of monk and it has this power that modifies this other power that I already have? That's just pleasurable, you know? So so some of it probably comes from that, but part of it, just like intuitive to who I am, um, you know, like some people love, people love a variety of experiences and I really like improvisational kind of experiences. Uh, where you're not sure what's about to happen. And if fun is going to happen, it's going to happen because people there make it and, and you trust them. And um, But then the last part of the answer, maybe the most important one, is um, I worked with Doug Church and the, and the people at Looking Glass, Mark LeBlanc and Tim Stelmach and Rob Fermier and Artman and all these bright guys, who had, some of whom had gone to MIT. And then they in Boston, they, there was Looking Glass Technologies. Um, and our looking glass entertainment, whatever it was called. Um, and they made my favorite run of games of all time. They made underworld 
the one and two, they made Thief one and two, they made System Shock one and two. Or I guess Irrational technically made System Shock two. Um, they made Terra Nova, a brilliant overlooked game in there. Um, and I might be forgetting one, but it, it was just this amazing run of games with w- what you have to call a singular vision because it's like first person uh, with this focus on you are there and they're a hybrid of shooter and RPG. And it, it really was as a player, uh, it's what I loved even before they did it because there were games like Eye of the Beholder 1 and 2, which were brilliant, and Blood Witch and Captive and Dungeon Master in 1987, this first person, you know, blend of shooter combat um, RPG with some emergent mechanics. And uh, anyway, I, I, I love those games and I guess they did too. And so they ended up making these brilliant uh, smooth scrolling versions of those. And it was just like crack to me, but um, <laughs> anyway, those designers and programmers and artists, and they had done such brilliant work. And I, rem- they're the first people I heard talking about emergent behavior, probably because they had covered subjects like that at MIT or whatever. But anyway, there was this, there was this moment in underworld where there was this big puzzle and it's an inverted ziggurat, I think. And you come to it and there are these dials on the wall. And what you have to do is like, you you can't jump high enough to just jump down and jump up on the other side. You have to like solve the puzzle so that the inverted ziggurat, the bottom floors rise up so you can walk across to get to the other side. And there are all these dials on the wall. And I remember fiddling with the dials, but I'm not really a puzzle guy. I really hate making my brain do things like that. Um, you know, like the logic and writing it down. And, and and I just looked at the puzzle and I was like, okay, the other side is slightly higher than this side. So I can't just levitate and float across. But what if I jump and at the apex of the levitation, I cast, or at the apex of the jump, I cast levitate. And then I just like ceiling crawl across the room and drop down on the other side. I wonder if that will work and I won't have to solve this puzzle that someone put a hundred hours into making or whatever. And I did it and it worked and far be it from feeling like I cheated the game or that it wasn't uh, a cool outcome or whatever. I felt like I owned that moment, that solution. I was so exhilarated. Um, And I told somebody about that one time, one of the people that worked on it and they were like, yeah, we knew about that. And we decided to leave it in because players felt very clever when they figured that out. And, um, you know, and it was just like that really stayed with me, you know? And so, uh, we have goofy, funny examples on, on Deus Ex. We, the, the, you could attach the proximity explosives to the wall and then walk away. And when somebody walked by a guard on a patrol or whatever, it would blow it up. And so there were smart moves, like put it next to an alarm. And that way, if anybody's going to run for the alarm and they would sound the alarm anyway, the gas grenade goes off and knocks them out or the explosion goes off and it destroys the alarm and everything. Um, but we left collision on, on those. So they had just enough collision. If you hopped up, you could, you, your collision box was on it. You could kind of stand on it. And so you could place one on the wall and then another one a little higher and hop to that one and then turn around and disarm the bomb and take the first one and put it a little higher and hop to it and turn around and take the other one and disarm it. And you could just like, sort of like walk your way up the wall, climb up these by hopping from what, you know, these wall mounted magnetic explosives or whatever and get out of the maps and stuff. It was a disaster, but it was funny. And, uh, and it, it, it's just like, you know, those are like probably like goofball, maybe degenerative versions of it. But once you start thinking along those lines, how could we put systems together that let players get creative um, and, and come up with solutions we didn't think of, even if it feels a little game breaking, it's magical when that happens for people. And then the problem is people are so trained on roller coaster games where everything just happens in front of them. You know, the helicopter crashes in front of them at the right moment and all that, that they might just sit there and go, well, when is this game going to be fun? Instead of like <laughs> experimenting and, you know, like, what can I make in the kitchen with these ingredients? Uh, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? It is. And I mean, clearly there's something that you have to explain to players, right? To help them understand that emergent mechanics is a thing in the game. But I'm actually pretty interested in hearing about the team. And, and, and finding out, did you ever get any 
sort of pushback on taking it too far. Like you pointed out that with emergent mechanics, there are a lot of ways you can break things in most games if you're if you're going a little bit crazy. Did you ever feel like people were going, wait a second, we got to ship this game at some point. Uh, this is just going to be impossible. And if they did, how would you get around that? Yeah, there, there's that's always the conversation. And sometimes I'm on the other side of it, by the way. Often I'm on the other side of it. Um, you know, and I think sitting down and thinking through all the possible ways people could break something with this crazy feature and then deciding, is that worth it or not? Um, and then deciding if it's a core, if, if it's an important feature and if so, you should lop some other things off. Um, it's that kind of process, you know, you use filters. Like if you look at dishonored, which was, um, you know, collaboration with Raphael Colantonio for me, cause we were co-creative directors on it and he's a long-term friend. I mean, he walked over this weekend and we, we walked to a restaurant a few blocks away that was full. And then we, as a result, we were stuck and starving and we walked a few blocks more to a vegan place that we didn't want to eat at and ate there. We're still friends and we still do things all the time. We talk about games and you know how it is in a relationship. You're still years later. And I think, I think this is probably true for every programmer, artist, designer that work in games, sound guy, producer, like where you, you, you know, you butt heads on things, you forget why you did something, the context for the argument or whatever, but you're still processing it years later uh, as a relationship, right? So we talk about this kind of stuff all the time, but like, you know, if you just take an example of like, okay, early on, there were people that were like, no, we don't want anything unknown in the game, you know? And it's like, you can make a great game that way. I feel like generally the Half-Life games are, polished were polished to a you know an inch of their life and they they're fantastic and everything is pretty much gonna follow suit from one player to the next if they follow the same path i think um and we went a different way which is probably less mainstream in a way because it it you know it, it requires a little more work on the part of the player to to find the drama maybe i don't know but in any case um there were early days where people were like, no, let's don't do that. That's not the way this works. But we won those battles because it's so exciting when you discover something. It feels less about the designer and more about you. Yeah. Uh, while it's still curated by the designers, right? It's still like a thing by the game team. It, it's still shaped by their overall ethos and, and, and their themes and all that and the systems they made and all that. Um, but then what you're talking about is more like, a given feature or something. And just to, to use an example, I was talking about Raph, um, Dishonored had possession, right? And it, we went through this exercise up front. We were like on a whiteboard, let's list all the places. If it was 1850s and I was an assassin in London, which was where we started, it eventually became Dunwall. But what kind of places would I want to go kill someone? You know, a crowded market bazaar. Well, we can't do crowds. Oh, fuck. Okay. Um, you know, what about the the vatican kill the pope oh that's cool yeah let's do that one um you know what about uh you know we 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 go through all of these different things like um what about a mat you know what what about in a flooded part of the city or something everybody would list their ideas for like cool places you could go in that setting and then in another column we listed like what are the ways you could off people right like make it look like an accident or uh, brand them so that they're uh, persona non grata, so they, they, you know nobody will talk to them or whatever. Uh, have them identities, have their identity switch with somebody else so they get executed. Or there were all these conversations happening, right? And so things like that are happening. And, and and the question is like, does that fit into an assassination game? Does that fit into a steampunk game? Does that fit into 1850s? Does that fit into the game we're making? So you you make filters. So there aren't so many arguments because then it becomes, we've all agreed to these filters. Now the argument is, does it fit within that filter, right? But, um, but when and, it comes to something like, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna ask, I mean, using those filters, did that diffuse the arguments pretty quickly or mm -hmm. remove the emotion from the arguments? Very often it does. And also having studio creative values, it does, mm -hmm. right? Like you, if you come to work at Arcane, you know the ground, we, in, in orientation, we cover the creative values. 
And so it, it, it helps resolve a lot of arguments because this is what we're doing. You know, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, and Dishonored, Prey, and Redfall are all very different games, but they overlap. There's a strong Venn diagram where if, if, if 12 tenets are true about arcane games, nine out of 12 of those are true in all of them, even though Dishonored has a greater focus on stealth and Prey has a greater focus on physics and contiguous space and continuous time. Um, but anyway, I, just to use an example, Possession came up because Disguise is obviously a part of the sort of milieu of thieves and rogues and assassins and possession is since you're a supernatural assassin though we, we came up with this sort of internal tagline supernatural assassin in a steampunk city to so guide us north star us back to what we needed to do right and so you know possession was like oh it's it's like costumes or disguise let's not do both initially both were on the board but let's let's only do one let's, and this one feels more like supernatural assassin you can possess people and enter them bodily. You're, you're hiding inside their skin and walk around in the world as them. But, oh, my God, what if you pass? You know, we had a scene earlier with this guard talking to his fiance, who's an accountant for this whaling company or whatever. And now if you walk him past her, she needs to say, like, aren't you supposed to be at work? You know, or whatever. They, they, have, a, they have a relationship. And uh, that's, ooh, that's more work, right? <laughs> and what if... Um, you know, his fellow guards see him doing something like that you're doing, you're stealing or, or, or assassinating someone. How do they react? And and then what if you cast it on a fish or a rat? And how, how do you? And so it became a full feature. It was like people will come up with situations here. Uh, and I'll give you one in a second that feel very like improvisational. Uh, but we're going to have to handle so many edge cases. Is this feature worth doing? And we had to cut a number of other things probably just to be able to do that, right? Because it's so much work to support possession. But then in the end, what you get is like, you know, one time in the game, I I bumped something and a bottle fell off a table and it broke. I think I hopped up on something in a way that I shouldn't have. And around the corner, a guard went, hey, what was that? And he started coming around the corner. I hear his feet. I heard him draw his sword. And at that moment, I happened to look down and we have an ambient rat population spawning system as well, of course. And I saw this rat walking around and I just like cast possession on the rat. And when the guard came around the corner, he saw the rat and was like, oh, just a rat, you know, and then tried to stomp on the rat and then he left or whatever. And then I ejected out of the rat. And, uh, you know, it was like moments like that that just felt so tense. But I was really trying not to kill any guards in that playthrough and not be spotted. And uh, that was a magical moment for me because that like rat happened to be there at the right moment and I happened to have possession and uh, I accidentally knocked a bottle over, you know, so it, it all worked out. I, a, I love that example uh, because it's a great, to me at least, it's a great lesson for n not ratcheting down the constraints early so that yeah. you have those opportunities to discover uh, cool things that you never would have found it right. <laughs> and, and sort of leading from that question, what, how often would you come up with say a mechanic like possession or another mechanic in the game and say, look guys, let's just try it out. I know we can think of a thousand ways this will break everything, but let's put a few weeks into making it work and just see how it goes. <laughs> I mean, how, did you guys do that a lot or did you kill things? or embrace them without that step. Yeah, so we, we have all the approaches, right? We have, on the heaviest end, we have, no, we love this idea so much um, that we need to heavily invest in it. Like the parts of the team at Arcane that had worked on Dark Messiah um, before I even got there, they had done some of the things like first person perspective, sword fighting and blocking and um, knocking people into things like over railings and into sharp things. Uh, which we internally call throw hit reacts, you know, um, it's very satisfying when you can knock someone forward and they go back off a railing and scream and fall, you know. Um, so there were there was a lot of institutional knowledge around some features we knew we were going to do. Um, if this was an assassination game with swords and all that, you were going to do some of those things. Uh, and then there were ideas that we would often say, let's just try it. Let's just try it. Raph and I feel very strongly about it. Let's just try it. And some of those ended up going pretty far and then getting killed or getting 
deferred into, you know, post launch into some DLC or something. Um, and then we had things that we call, we, we refer to as killing it in the egg, where we just talk about it briefly and say, I got it out of my system and needed to talk about it. Hmm. Three people at the table said, that's not a good idea, or that doesn't fit, or uh, it's cool, but we don't have time to, to, to do it well. Like you don't want to do a hundred features and all of them are at 50%. You know, you, you'd rather do uh, 20 features and all of them are at a hundred percent, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, we have, we had all of that, you know, and um, still do, right. Like we talk about things all the time. And in, in fact, I feel like, you know, sometimes we're probably, we push it too far because, um, you know, you you sit down years in advance you know what i'm talking about it's like three or four years in advance and or I'm, who am i kidding four or four plus years in advance and and you look and you're like all right we're gonna make this game here's the general overview of it here's some of the features we think are going to be cool here's why we think the setting's going to be cool um this is a feature we haven't done before we want to double down on um and then you have to look at that on the whiteboard or in your head as you imagine playing it. You have to visualize being there and playing it. And you're like, does this turn players on? Do they like this? How will this compete against the things that we don't even know about right now or the sequels to the things that are out right now? Uh, will it, you know? And so when we worked on Dishonored, it, it, it was like, we all loved games like Dishonored and Thief and things like that. And so, and we had worked in that space and we wanted to do that kind of thing again, a purist version of it. Um, and, um, you know, even when we started it, people would, so even internally, people would say, oh, so you're working on a Bioshock clone or, and it was just infuriating, right? Because it's like, um, I love Bioshock. I think it's brilliant, but it wasn't the first of that type of game. And there's a reason it's called Bioshock, you know? And, uh, and then somebody else would be like, Oh, you're working on a thief clone. And it's like, well, this is an homage to thief for sure. For sure. We love thief so much. It's Raph's favorite game of all time. Like, um, and, and we were talking off and on to Doug church. who was one of the guys on thief. Right. And we asked him at some point, if you could do thief over today, what would you do? And he said, you know, Thief rewards the players for going slow. I'd find a way to also go fast. And so we that's where Blink probably came from. You know, we, we talked about having a sprint feature or something like that. Um, and so these games fit into some sort of like history of those games or whatever, I guess. But like, um, yeah, just uh, kicking around what should go in it and whether it's going to be inspiring because if it's safe, if it's if the producers are like, oh, yeah, I looked at the schedule on day one and it it looks good, plenty of time, no worries, then uh, you you might not be pushing it hard enough, you know. Like the, the are the players really going to be like, wow, I can't believe they did that, or I tried this thing and it worked, and uh, or I found this corner of the world that I'd never seen before, and um, or we had this super intense battle because of this one crazy creature showed up and I can't believe it, you know, and um, it's, it's, I think it's only if people are a little nervous, you, you know, about it working out that you have a chance of, of exciting, uh, the audience. I think that's such a great point. You know, playing it safe can lead to, uh, expected results, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, better not to do it. And, and then I know you probably wrestle frequently as all of us who are involved in development these days do with scope versus, ambition, right? And, and playing it safe, incre sorry, playing it unsafe, right? Increases ambition almost exponentially sometimes. So, you know, as a, as somebody now who is leading creative teams, what, what is the calculus that you tend to do when it, when it comes to pushing for those out of the box ideas that are going to surprise people? And at the same time, ensuring that, you know, the team can, can deliver and stay healthy and and then be excited about whatever's coming next. Yeah, half the time I'm listening to someone else pitch it, and I can tell they're excited about it. Some programmer mm -hmm. or designer on the team, uh, and then sometimes it comes from me or Ricardo or you know our art director Karen or somebody, um, our lead level designer Rich. You know, somebody will say something, and um, so, so our gameplay programmers come up with 
some of our coolest features because they're down in the nitty gritty. Yeah. And they'll be like, yeah, this is actually how that works. And here's the thing you could do. And it's like, oh, that's cool. Um, but you kind of have to have a sense, I think, for whether it's exciting and how much work it's going to be and whether it fits into the thing you're working on. Um, and the answer isn't just like infinite money and infinite time or crunching the team to death. Um, you know, so it's all a balancing act. I've worked on games that have lost money. I've worked on games that have made lots of money. I've worked on games that have been late. Never worked on one that was early, honestly. Um, but like, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, you don't control most of those variables. Um, the only thing you can control is like, am I making a good game? If I play it, is it starting? It, it doesn't really happen until around beta in my experience, but like, is it really starting to become the sort of gestalt that we wanted it to be where all these things are possible and it's, it's really fun and interesting. It's intriguing and mysterious and cool. And, um, uh, you know, and, um, yeah. And so you, you can control that part more than you can control anything else. And, and I've worked on projects before where we got greenlit for a given budget and then the company said, if you sell this many copies, we'll be happy. If you sell this many, we'll be thrilled. Uh, but your green light, your budget, it sort of justifies these things and this marketing sub budget and all that stuff. And then on one particular game I'm thinking about, we were like pretty late, pretty significantly late, but the game like tripled the sales forecast. And so nobody minded, nobody cared. They were like, oh my God, we just made more money with this game than we by three than we thought we were going to. Um, and, you know, at the time we were getting beaten up because we needed four more months or six more months or whatever. Uh, but tripling the projected money is well worth six more months of expenditure. And, but somebody has to make a gamble on that. Somebody on the financial side, the sales side. And then once the game launches, all the, all the other pieces, the marketing piece, the PR piece, I, there's tremendous amounts of work from people that don't get very much respect, honestly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little different now in the pandemic and it's a little different now that things are more digital, but uh, it's still, you know, how you recoup and how you fund the next thing is, uh, and what players complain about versus what they have an appetite for. Like sometimes there are things players complain about that they, you know, the numbers show that they're buying in droves, you know, so it's, um, it's all tricky. It's very, very tricky. And uh, again, the only thing you really control, I think, is the thing you're working on, right? So if you can make the best game you can make for players, that's the, that's the one piece that will like always pay off, in my opinion. I, I agree. And actually, you bring up a really interesting conundrum within the industry. And that is, Sometimes a separation of uh, the dev cult, dev culture, and uh, publishing culture, or mm -hmm. support culture, even. And I know that we've been very fortunate to work with salespeople and finance folks and legal folks who are gamers themselves. And so it makes the argument about an additional four months or something that you need a lot easier because they can see the vision and you know the the opportunity potentially is to have more and more people in those parts of the industry who grew up playing games and are excited about games from the beginning. Cause it's probably today. Um, if you have those folks, it's easier to, to justify those big decisions. I know that back way back when we were talking about the nineties, that was absolutely not the case, right? Because <laughs> we, you and I, as um, people in our mid to late twenties were working with folks in their sixties and 50s who were controlling the purse strings who may not be gamers, probably mm -hmm. weren't gamers at all. <laughs> I swear this sounds like a, <laughs> I swear this sounds like a scene from a movie. I didn't make it up. It's totally true. And it, and it, it falls into the category of I miss it and I don't miss it, you know, at that time. But I was, I got on the elevator at Origin one time and stepped in the back corner, you know, and I'm wearing cut off shorts and like unlaced high top sneakers and uh, probably at the time, either my Green Lantern t-shirt that was like way too large or my Cure t-shirt that was way too large. And it was the nineties. It was like full on nineties. So like, you know, I might've had frosted hair and a little <laughs> goatee, goatee or something. And it's just ridiculous. Right. I was like 26 years old. And, 
uh, these two executives, which will remain nameless, who totally never played a game in their lives, stepped onto the elevator and barely noticed me and then turned to face the door. And they were talking about something. And uh, I think golf or something, right? Like this is like, I'm nothing wrong with golf. A lot of my friends play golf, whatever, but like I am not a golf guy. And it it strikes me as instantly culturally tone deaf to just start talking about golf, but whatever. And somebody had gotten in the elevator. There was this one guy we'd get in the elevator and he, he would hammer the buttons like a road runner. Like he would, he would, and until he, he, his goal was to break the button, I'm pretty sure. And so the button, one button, the, the ground floor button was always cracked. And one of them said, one of the two guys in suits looked at it and said, these people are animals. And then they both turned back and looked at me. And I just like, you know, <laughs> blank stare straight ahead. I didn't hear you. I'm, I'm lost in my own world. And then the elevator opened and we all got out. But it's like, yeah, there's, there's, you, you can be in very unfortunate situations with uh, people who have no love for what you're doing. They don't see the passion side of it. They don't see the art side of it. They don't see the like, we can do more with this medium. We can, we can change the world with this medium. We can make meaningful works. It's not just like, how much money did we make? Um, and uh, I've been really lucky. Uh, there's a reason I've been at Arcane for 12 years, like or more now. Uh, Zenimax acquired us 10 years ago, and it's like, you know, just like a developer savvy, developer focused group of people. Yeah. Even in places where they're not, like our, I love our legal, our head of legal is amazing. You know, like they, I know so many people at the company, but it's like they. The reason uh, is they made all their money listening to Todd Howard and the Bethesda game studios uh, studio. And like, you know, from Morrowind forward, they've just been fallout and all those amazing games, Skyrim, which is coming and all that, that it's uh, Skyrim Starfield. Sorry. Skyrim is not coming again. Uh, it's an accident. I, I was, I was uh, about to. Uh, <laughs> really <excited there. laughs> oh God. It's late in the day. Sorry. Um, yeah, like they, they've done so well and made so many huge, amazing games that like, I feel like what it has done is engendered a, a culture of publisher trust where yeah. like when people, the creative people start talking about something crazy or the technical people, you know, it's, you kind of have to listen to them because that's their field and that's if they believe in it. And I've heard people at Zenimax say that, you know, the execs and stuff like, uh, oh man, Robert Altman was such a gem was such a rare guy passed recently. Yeah. Uh, and I learned so many things from him and he was just kind of an amazing, unique character. Um, but I remember at the end of Dishonored, there was a moment like we were pitching some Dishonored 2 stuff and talking to him and he was celebrating us. He was, he was really patting us on the back and talking about what the game had done. And, uh, he said, I'm going to be honest here. I didn't understand half of what you guys were pitching, but uh, you did and you believed in it. And that's, that's what was important. And uh, you know, he's talking about the steampunk elements and possessing rats and fish and all, all this crazy stuff that you can do in Dishonored, you know? So it, I, I think it's about trust and it's uh, when they come back to me, when our marketing and sales people or PR people come back to me and tell me, this is the way we should do this because um people will understand it more clearly. They'll understand what you're actually trying to say, or the timing works out better. It will build better, build better excitement. They know what they're talking about. I, yeah. I, I do. And I don't, right? Like I've been around for a while, but I, it's not my field. And so just mutual trust. And, and they're also okay with us challenging them. No, no, no. We, we feel this way because we've been, we're consumers too. We're players too. And we feel we've been burned by this or that or whatever. And it's just like, once you're with a group of people that trust each other, um it's very pleasant and uh again that's there's a reason i've been there 12 years so well i think that's a, yeah, it's a great commentary on how our industry has evolved for the better i mean it is it is much more one uh f group of people who have a common interests no matter where you are in any of these organizations right uh, if you're if you get your hands on the game and you're actually designing levels or creating assets or if you are helping the people support the folks who are doing the same thing, everybody tends to love the craft, which is, which is such a cool evolution. I never, I really um, hadn't thought about that before this conversation and, and how lucky we are to have seen that evolution over the last 
30 years and that's super cool. Um, yeah, that's it. That's interesting. You know, the, that it's it just in this time period, it's, uh, Raf used to say, uh, we're one generation away from having a gamer president. And, that uh, is so true, right? <laughs> you think we're, yeah. we just got to start electing some younger people. Yeah. Slightly, and so slightly it's, younger than it's. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought after Obama, I was like, well, of course that means the next one probably, you know, will be a, a fan of games or whatever, but like, then we went the other way, I think, you know, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, it's going to happen though, for sure. Next, <laughs> yeah. next one, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, oh, so go, going back into sort of being a creative leader, um, you know, what, one of the things that I really have loved in the Dishonored series and, and also I'd, I'd say, um, I'm looking forward to in Redfall is you're in your team's sort of embracing of this reality plus alternate history. You have a lot of trappings that feel very grounded to me, but you, in, in your games, but you take a stylistic, you twist things pretty stylistically. I mean, from the, the way the humans look in your games, which are, you have your own unique visual style, which is super cool to the way you weave elements of history into the stories and into the mechanics. Is that something that Arcane has sort of always embraced and you as a creative leader have encouraged? Well, I think a lot, again, a lot of that, you know, will come from the art department and all, but like, you know, on Dishonored, Raph and I gave the green light on minute one. We were like, we like stylized worlds. We don't mm -hmm. want a hyper real world. Um, we don't want a hyper real world. We, we want to, uh, something that is distinct when you see a screenshot you know it's our game and sebastian matone was an art director uh jean-luc monet assistant art director they worked with victor antonoff the visual design director and uh, those people and all the people around them all the whole team that have assembled there they they have such a deep learning about our deep understanding of art history and art styles and how history and not just history of what was going on, what was in the heads of the people at the time. Oh, they had just gone through world war two, or they had just gone through, you know, um, this big religious movement or whatever, but also like, Oh, here, there's a medium that they worked with. This is one paintings from that period. The lighting looks the way it does because this is the kind of oil paint they use or whatever. Um, and here's the architecture, you know, the, uh, for Dishonored, they went to Edinburgh and London, took a bunch of photos, and not just of the architecture, but like of construction workers and stuff. Because there's a there's a wider range of faces in Europe than there is in America, honestly. Uh, I lived in Germany for three years, and I lived in Lyon, France for four years. And just riding the metro, it's just like a wider range of of genetic kind of like shapings of of the of the faces and all. But um, uh, and so you know, we're into stylized stuff and games are getting to the point where games can look like concept art and why not, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of history and research, we did on the lower side for Dishonored, we did a lot of research and just like reading about, you know, why do we have regulations today? I know some people are against regulations, but like in London, they said in the 1600s or 1500s, you could stand there and at some point in the day, hear this huge crash because buildings were collapsing with fair frequency. Like a, a child would be born or the, the you know mother would announce she's pregnant and father would take the oldest son or the oldest kid and they would go out to a bedroom and they would climb out on the window and start building another room or something and supporting it, you know, with, with, with pieces underneath. And, and like, do they have, is it up to code? Did they have the background for that? I don't know, but there were a lot of collapses, you know, where the wood would just splinter and collapse. And uh, that's why we have regulations and it, you can be against regulations on principle. And I, I personally think you're an idiot if that's the case, because these things weren't just, nobody waved a magic wand and said, we should have more nanny state regulations. It's like, we did this because there were collapses. We did this because, you know, three or four kids living in this room would just like fall off the side of the building or whatever. Right. Um, and so we did a lot of research that influenced our thinking on how the city would be put together and what jobs that would be there and all that. We, there was like this record we came across. People were keeping cause of death records in Europe like way back. 
And we found this record that was like, I don't remember what year it was. I want to say it was the 1500s or something or the 1200s or I think it was probably the 1500s. But like um, in either London or, or, or the UK that year or, or England that year, it was like 7,000 people died of teeth. And that just means your teeth went bad and you, and you had abscesses and infections and you just died from it. And it's just like, you know, it sounds horrific from our standpoint, but like it, that little line in some book, and I probably got half of it wrong just there and apologies to any historians listening, but like that affected us so deeply. Cause we we're like, this is the world these people are living in. You know, it's very different than the modern world. And it influences some of their thinking about death and aging and it makes youths probably so fleeting, you know, um, even more than it is now. I mean, like now I'll be out on the trail and some 50 year old will run by me. He's got a six pack or whatever. And he's pushing like some sort of like baby stroller that looks like a, you know, uh, an ATV uh, and he's ripped, you know, and it's like, wow, we're really living in a different world, you know, um, that we're that guy probably has money. And so he has access to health care. Um, but anyway uh yeah research makes the world richer it makes the world more detailed it gives you all these little ideas it 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 bends your game towards certain themes um you know deus ex had a lot of conspiracy theories in it and it just it just seems crazy you you go down this rabbit hole of why do these people believe this how do they believe this like okay some of them are like i get it there's enough mystery around this where you don't know who killed the president exactly, but some of the far-fetched ideas are just really out there. And like, usually the simpler explanation is, is the right ex explanation, you know, the one that makes sense and you don't have to make any weird leaps for or whatever. But, <laughs> and I, and then there was a period that was fun, right? Those were fun conspiracies. And then there was a period where it would like got dark, where it was like, you know, middle-aged men, super angry online, like, you know, uh, jet fuel doesn't melt steel beams or whatever. And it, and it took an engineer a while to articulate a defense. It's way faster to throw bullshit than it is to actually, you know, expose, or, you know, detail why something is true or why it's not true or whatever. Um, and it took engineers a while to say like, no, but it weakens, it, it softens metal. And then it doesn't support the same, it doesn't have the same load bearing. And so a building would collapse if it just warmed, if the metal just warmed, it doesn't, it doesn't have to melt. The, the whole presupposition of your statement, your angry statement is wrong because it doesn't have to melt. It just has to, to weaken a little bit. And suddenly the massive weight of this building will crush the whole building. But like, it's such a fascinating thing. And then of course, in the modern age, like since it's been weaponized, somebody realized, oh, this could be weaponized. It's a... Uh, it's just wild and it's not fun anymore. You know, the conspiracy thing is terrifying that people believe some of the things they believe and that others take advantage of that whole phenomenon. But, but the research into, into games and why people in different periods of time thought what they thought and uh, how they built things. And, you know, uh, it's all fascinating, you know. I think it's great that you do that. I mean, it just lends an authenticity even to, to your games, even though they're not, trying to mimic reality right uh it's yeah it's cool. i'm a, i'm a lightweight also like the games uh, get more and more specialized every year and so like on our current project ricardo bear and hazel Monforton do a lot of research and um they're both deeper into history than i am and uh, i've had over the time i've worked with hazel i've had so many fascinating conversations about bog bodies in the north of you know um the uk and uh, what you know the, if you look up bog bodies it's like this endlessly fascinating uh subject right and it's uh like you could take any single thing like that and and dig into it and it's just um, super interesting um but yeah if, if you're working on a project and you have some subject matter and you haven't done any research into it you're uh, you're missing the best things that you can, the most interesting ideas that you'll get and stuff, I think. But yeah. anyway. Well, now you've just announced Redfall, right? As mm -hmm. an open world multiplayer shooter, which to me, you know, visually at least has some real connections to the games that you guys have made, just stylistically in terms of the characters, but it's 
looks like a completely different story. And it seems like a pretty big shift from your past games in terms of uh, just mechanics and the fact that it's multiplayer. So did you get the reaction you expected when you announced it? And were people surprised? Uh, the response to Redfall has been so overwhelmingly positive that we are just thrilled. Like being able to announce it at the uh, Microsoft event uh, during E3 and, and to be, you know, Todd opened that show with Starfield and then we went through the whole the whole show, you know, um, Pete Hines did a little segment on the, the Bethesda games and uh, Phil closed the show out. Phil Spencer closed the show out. Um, I'm so terrified one day I'm going to say Phil Spector, by the way. And uh, is it the, the image of that music producer with the crazy ass hair, you know, like it comes to mind. But uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Phil Spencer, you know, closed out the show. With, There's one more surprise. And, and, and it was, you know, we got to show the Arcane game and uh, Redfall, just like, you know, people gave us their reactions and it's just so exciting. We look forward to uh, giving more information when we can. There's a lot of stuff that is obvious and, and, and people got it, you know, the characters and uh, the villains and the, the setting and all that. And then there's some features that I think people are going to absolutely love that they they don't know about yet, you know. So, um, but yeah, that was, uh, we, we said internally, we took us a while to absorb how that, what all happened and how it worked and how, powerful it was and um you know it's it's not a given that your launch that your announcement or not your launch because we haven't launched yet but your announcement it's not a given that your announcement goes super super well sure. um a million things can go sideways um and so it took the coordinated effort of a bunch of people uh and we worked and worked we have you know we have like i said our creative values at arcane that help us um see clearly about whether we should do this or that in a game and all our games will all, always overlap in a venn diagram of of you know hybrid first person shooter and rpg features very immersive very narrative rich etc um but um god i just lost the thread of my thought what was well i don't said? i'm not asking you I, I don't want you to spend a lot of time on the features i know it's early i actually wanted to share that i was really impressed with the diversity of your protagonists. Uh, and, I, and I think that kind of represents, at least for me, Arcane's focus on unsure, in ensuring better representation for underrepresented groups. And I, I know you've talked about that before uh, a bit, but it's cool. And it's something that doesn't really get elevated to the press very frequently. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, about how you guys, you know, what, what you think about with your character representation in your games? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been powerfully affected by hearing people's stories um, about, you know, um, r reading comics and growing up and loving comics and only seeing people in the comics that did not look like them, you know, like mm -hmm. that look like white dudes or whatever. Uh, and that when there was that one character or one or two characters that were, you know, uh, look like, look like them or look like, you know, somebody other than that standard template, it was powerful for them. And, uh, that has stayed with me. Um, it was a little light bulb coming on, you know, uh, and we worked on this project. We worked with Evan Narcisse who yeah. wrote a pretty seminal piece on, um, why can't I see hair like mine in a video game? You know, like, um, why, why do video games not get black hair? Right. You know, that, that kind of thing. And um, so representation is a powerful emotional thing for me, like seeing someone else, you know, talk about how their their kid gets to read comics about Miles Morales, um, who maybe looks more like the kid and has a family background like the kid, instead of having to warp themselves. I love Peter Parker as much as anybody. But like, you know, warp themselves so that they 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 follow the exploits of Peter Parker, you know, and uh, even though he's different. Right. So representation is so powerful. Um, and you just have to listen a little bit like, you know, I love the MCU and I have friends who hate the MCU. I'm an MCU stan. Um, and I remember when. Captain Marvel came out. I love it so much. It's set in the nineties. It's got Samuel Jackson, D age. I mean, it's got all these things that are great in it. 
and going to the theater with some female friends, like, and listen to the, the things that I responded to. This was cool. That was cool. This was cool. But the things they responded to, like another dude is trying to gaslight them, her at the end of the movie. And, 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 uh, you know, don't use your powers, fight me fairly. And she's just like knocks him on his ass. Right. Like, like things like that along the way, the things that they responded to, like you could, you could just blow that off or you could be angry about it or whatever. I don't know. I don't know why you'd be angry, but like, or you could stop and say like, Hey, there's a reason why all of these people are responding to this a certain way. Why is it so powerful to them? Oh, it must be because this is part of their experience and they never get it. They never get to see it represented in media, especially goofy media, like superhero movies, you know, of all things. Um, and that's one answer, right? Like it's powerful. It's a, and I, 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 I feel emotion when I think about that. I feel like a sadness for them. I feel a, a guilt, you know, for, for absorbing all this for so many years without even being aware of it. Uh, of that this was going on in the minds of other people in the hearts of other people, but that's not even the real reason. Like that, that's half that half of it. Clearly the other half is I'm just bored. Like I'd be bored if I had to come up with another character that was just like JC Denton or whatever. Right. He's a cool character, but like, um, let me do something else. Let, let it, let us stretch, you know, like we did Corvo. Corvo's awesome. We did Dowd. Dowd is awesome. And then, you know, we did Emily Caldwin and we love K Emily. She's awesome. Then we did Billy Lurk and she's awesome. Like, you know, um, as a creative person, you don't want to do the same thing over and over. Um, and you want to see other people's interesting takes on things, you know, like um, uh, the Zack Snyder uh, stuff recently was really interesting because on one hand, I was not a fan of that movie, the original, and the the the, the Snyder Cut was better, but I, I wasn't even really that much of a fan of that one. I don't think it's as good as the MCU stuff, right? But like, on one hand, like, let that person, let that director have his say, let him and his team make their movie the way they wanted to make their movie. I'm very much for that because bombastic operatic dark like whatever they want to do with the characters it's it's at least a perspective right and it shouldn't it shouldn't be like you know sanded down to nothingness uh and with no perspective or no interesting take or whatever and on the other hand fans demanding things is kind of scary too because it's like that is also uh sometimes um flies in the face of people being able to do their thing right like uh we do things sometimes that that players don't like uh because we liked it and some other players do like it you know you you, you and your angry friend don't represent all the players right there are other players that maybe in some cases there's 10 times many players who told us we did the right thing you know so that whole thing about like interacting with the public and hearing from people and people getting angry on one hand, it's awesome because they're passionate. You know, they believe in what you're doing or they, they love some part of it and they want to see it done a certain way. And that's, that's cool. On the other hand, it gets dark really fast. You know, it, it, there's, there's somebody tunes a sniper rifle by a tiny amount and gets death threats or whatever. That's just like, uh, and it, and, and there's always the people that are like somebody threatening you on Twitter is not, uh, real. And it's like, man, until you've lived through that, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, I don't even know how much of that should be like part of the conversation, but it's, uh, well, it's a developer reality. I mean, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It is, it is something that we all deal with, uh, unfortunately some more than others because of the creative decisions that we make. And mm -hmm. because there are people who, can be completely irrational about those decisions <laughs> and, and yeah. what they see in the games. And it's unfortunate. Uh, but Imagine how boring the world would be if all the games had all the same characters in them <laughs> and all the same approaches, you know, and it, 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 it's terrible, right? Like it's much more interesting when everybody goes a different direction and sort of seeds the world with all of these different ideas and perspectives and representations and uh, different takes, you know, like, um, uh, yeah.
And it really, it, I, I agree. And it has accelerated over the last decade. And that's what's so awesome to see as, as a developer. And so with that in mind, I kind of want to end with just one big, another big broad question for you. And as somebody who has made a huge impact on games for the last three decades, what is one area in which you'd like to see even more evolution in our industry? Um, God, I, it's, it's very tempting to say funding because uh, that's the key to everything, you know, like who gets to make games and what kinds of games you get to make and um, what the stakes are how much experimentation you can do and all it, it's, it's so driven by the, the cost of games and who ha controls the purse strings. Uh, that's maybe that's a, a banal answer for what, you know, where you were going with that. But I, I think it's the, the practical truth. Um, yeah. What up is in, so with, to the benefit of those listening who may be interested in, finding funding, starting their own game development company, uh, embarking on a project that's unique and special. Do you have any advice for them in terms of creative approaches? Honestly, I can't really speak to the first couple of those, but the, the one I can speak to, I think is like, you know, if you can somehow take a very honest look at your game and, you know, you simultaneously need to be recognizable, probably the game does and mm -hmm. also different. Um, yeah. what was that designer's name in the forties and fifties who had the concept of, uh, most advanced yet familiar or something or yet acceptable Maya. And he made the locomotive that looked really, uh, sleek and interesting. The refrigerator, it, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he's a designer that was very influential. I think a British designer that was influential in uh, New York, um, for a decade or two. And, uh, if you look up most advanced yet acceptable, you'll see, but it, but it means like this simultaneously needs to be something new that I feel like I need to have. Um, Lowy, I think that's his name. Uh, yet it also needs to not scare me. Like, I don't know what I'm buying if this, if I don't recognize this at all, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth my time, you know, so um, like a real hard look when I evaluate student works, which I mentor people off and on or, or, you know, critique their work or whatever, like very often there's just Raymond Lowy. Yeah, exactly. That's the name. But uh, somebody just popped up in chat. Um, uh, very often I just look at it and like, oh, this is a clone of this other game. And I don't use that term lightly because people have, you know, they always try to say your current game is a clone of some other game. And then later they use your game against the new developer to say, oh, you're the new developer. You're just making this thing that's a clone of their last game or whatever. And it's like, um, you know, we heard that Dishonored was a thief clone and we heard it was a Bioshock clone. And then later people look at other games and say, those are Dishonored clones. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, there's room for all the takes. Right. But um but when something's just straight up, same features, same art style, similar in in all ways, it's like, okay, that's familiar. That's acceptable in a way it, it, to, to go back to Maya, but it's not advanced. It doesn't advance things in any way. It's not interesting. Um, and if you change one thing, you know, you, you take this colorful game about a friendly frog, uh, you know, trying to do something. I'm making a game up right now. I'm trying not to use any example. And instead, you make the frog really gothed out. And when he dies, now the player has both the frog and his ghosts or something. You know, like it, it, it's like otherwise it's the same genre game, right? But there's this one cool, creepy thing that will now influence the music and the art style and everything else. And it's got that one feature that like now that I would buy because I love, you know, Colorful, friendly frog one, two, and three. I'm a big fan of that series, that genre. But now you've made this like you know, uh, post death feature goth version of the game, and I, I'm 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 into the minor note music and all that stuff. And um, um, it doesn't scare me because I know the gameplay mostly of that that game. But I, I think if I if I had to give anybody advice, I'm rambling a little bit, but it would be like take a long hard look at what you're doing and and say is it 
familiar enough and is it different enough? Uh, and then if you can articulate like creative values that you filter everything through, it will solve so many problems. It will resolve so many arguments. Um, it will help guide you toward um, a better game, I think, at the end of the day. That is fantastic advice. Thank you, Harvey. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing your story and your experiences. This has been great. Yeah, well, thank you for the time today. Uh, I'm glad it worked out. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.